I would like to show you that Rust is actually not a problem. The problem is you. <laughs> or I should rather say your habits and expectations you normally have from a programming language, especially if you knew some before. It turns out that giving up and forgetting is the way to go when learning Rust. And uh, today I would like to show you Rust from a bit different perspective. Um, it happens that if you give up some things, uh, learning Rust becomes a much better experience. You need to start asking why, why Rust does things the way it does, and everything becomes much simpler. So today I will talk about why we don't have classical OOP in Rust, why we don't have inheritance, how to avoid excessive cloning, why we have li lifetimes and how to look at them, and also I'll mention a bit about zero cost abstractions and uh, some things associated with them, as well as async. My name is uh, Krzysztof Grajek. I'm a solution architect slash senior software developer working daily in Scala at Software Mill, but I'm also responsible for Rust development in our company. And speaking of which, we have a senior Rust developer position open if you are interested. Rusticon is the first conference uh, organized by Software Mill regarding Rust but there are many others popping up around the world and in Poland, which is a very good thing for our community. And what I would like you to do today, during this lecture, shortly after, or during a longer break, is to exchange some social info with the colleague sitting next to you, so you can support each other on those platforms. We can build together a bigger and stronger community without any dramas, shout out to Scala people, and <laughs> with <laughs> and with a friendly atmosphere. So, let's start. Why Rust doesn't do classical OOP? Consider this example, where we have a trait shape and two structs implementing that trait, pretty simple. Um, what many newcomers in Rust are doing is that they jump straight into DIN uh, because they try to mimic inheritance. This, of course, has its consequences because it introduces dynamic dispatch, it uh, forces uh, our program to use virtual table lookup for function resolution, and once you start using DIN trait, it's almost inevitable to not use box and place stuff on the heap. So that's the first mistake, but what you should do instead? Rust is not about inheritance, it's about composition. So, and it prefers stack-based uh, memory layouts, and uh, you should structure your code keeping that in mind. So the first approach you should take is of course enums. Enums are nicely inlined for you uh, in memory by Rust compiler. They are pretty fast and uh, work. And in this example, a very simple example, of course, uh, changing that to enums, uh, to enums wasn't really difficult. I have created a very simple criterion benchmark just to show you that when we compare those two functions, one with uh, DIN trait and box allocations, and another one with enums. The enum version is, of course, twice as fast. But that was really, really simple example. But enums are not always the solution you can actually use. They are not that flexible, like DIN trait. And once you start nesting enums, you can end up in so-called enum hell in the Rust world where uh, your code becomes uh, really difficult to maintain. So, of course, many of you probably guess it by now, the solution to that 
is to go with generics. Generics are still using static dispatch. We have a nice monomorphization mechanism in place and we have best of both worlds. So we have static dispatch and we have flexibility. And another, another criterion benchmark for this case, when we compare DIN trade with box allocations and generics, and we have three times faster results. So to sum it up, what are people doing wrong with trades normally, especially at the beginning of the Rust journey, is that they try to mimic inheritance instead on, of uh, focusing on composition, where you should compose your model from smaller structs into bigger structs, where you should actually pick and choose the traits you want to implement and uh, avoid uh, dynamic dispatch and virtual table uh, resolutions. But that is only one point one why RAS doesn't do OP. The other is about memory. Consider this very, very simple example in Java, where we have a single class, single field, sorry, and the constructor, and we initiate that object with the new keyword, of course, probably everyone knows that. What happens is that, of course, this is placed on the heap and is managed by the JVM. In Rust, we don't have GC, of course, but imagine the situation where that class hierarchy is much bigger. We have deep nested hierarchies when we use object-oriented programming, and that means that objects are initialized all across the heap, and of course, in case of Java, you have no control over it when that will be reclaimed and cleaned. In Rust, on the other hand, everything is simple. The object goes out of scope uh, and it gets dropped. Another small point about the memory, uh, many people always forget at the beginning of the Rust journey, is the trust is doing a lot of optimization automatic for you. And with this simple example, and the struct called simple as well, where, we, where you have uh, three fields, that struct will always take four bytes, regardless of the order you put those fields in. Whereas in C example, for example, that struct will take six bytes because the memory is being laid out exactly as declared. So Rust is different and it doesn't do OOP, but it doesn't do OOP because OOP means deep nested hierarchies, it means dynamic dispatch, it means virtual table le resolutions, and uh, non-predictable memory layouts. Another aspect of Rust, which strikes fear into the hearts of many newcomers, are of course lifetimes. With this example, uh, where you have two references as input arguments and one reference as a return type, Rust compiler will force you to use lifetime annotations because it doesn't know, of course, which reference you want to return. But if you ask yourself why we have references, you will probably quickly realize that they are just a documentation tool. They help you think logically about your code. This example, of course, will not compile because the result is, uh, should have the same lifetime as the input argument. The solution to this is, of course, uh, putting it into a single scope. But what I want to stress out is that if you look at lifetimes as a documentation to help you think logically about your code, they are not that difficult. But, of course, you can have other examples where you have uh, multiple lifetimes, where you start placing lifetimes in your structs, then things become a bit more complex. So what you can do in those cases? Of course, many newcomers, what they do is they go straight to owned types. They get rid of uh, lifetime annotations, they use owned type like string in this example, and the problem is solved, right? 
But of course, we know that this leads to excessive cloning down the road, and we start using dot clone almost everywhere. But Rust has some tools to help you deal with that as well. You can use co uh, clone on write, which adds a bit more flexibility to your code. You still need to use lifetime annotations because at some point you can return the borrow type, but you can use co uh, not only as a, of course, a struct field, but as a function argument, as a function, function return value, and add some more flexibility to your solution. But there are other, other tools to help you avoid excessive cloning. One of those is Arc, one of the smart pointers, where, of course, you will end up placing stuff on the heap, like in this example with VEC123, but when you clone, you are not actually cloning, uh, deep cloning the data, you are just increasing the reference count. So in this example, both pointers will point to the same memory location. And ARC is just an example, but you have many others. There are uh, multiple smart pointers you can use to avoid excessive cloning and think about your code differently. Box is here just for brevity, but you have uh, RC for single-threaded environments. You have ARC for multi-threaded uh, mutex, uh, which you can mix and match, uh, etc. So, just one last thing about OOP. Uh, just uh, one thing you need to watch out for because I'm talking all the time about performance but zero-cost abstractions like uh, enums, like uh, generics, uh, have its cost. When, with this example, we have two versions of the same function, one taking din trait so approach and the second one taking generics, you need to be aware that doing monomorphization with generics uh, your binary size, your binary gets bloated, and it will probably end up with a bigger size. With this very simple example where we had two types for our shape, we end up with two LLVM lines, whereas with Dintrate, we'll end up only with one. And this is just a side note. So, another aspect of Rust, why Rust is different and why it does things differently is error handling. Consider the example in Java I have given. I know this is old Java. I haven't uh, coded in Java for at least 10 years, maybe 15. Uh, but of course, Java error handling is all about exceptions. If you think about it a bit closer, um, when exception is being thrown in Java, the exception object is placed on the heap, of course. But then, really slow, stack unwinding pro process takes place, and the stack trace of that stack uh, unwinding process ends up on the heap, also as part of that exception object. In Rust, we deal with errors, with zero-cost abstractions, with options, result type, etc., and first of all, is being optimized uh, for you automatically by the compiler. Second of all, with in in case when you deal with the error with match case statement, it's uh, you need to cover all the cases. Rust compiler um, cares about that, and uh, everything is much faster. There are couple of strategies you can use in Rust to deal with the errors. It depends, of course, of uh, what you normally do when you program in Rust, but uh, in terms of performance, again, I have created a small criterion benchmark so that I can show you that, of course, unwrapping on uh, the wrapper like result or option will be the fastest one. But of course, you cannot really use it everywhere unless you are pretty sure that whatever you unwrap is there. 
unless it's your logic, uh, and you expect uh, it to panic. The other option is when you deal with the error actually and do match case statements, this adds some branching and it's still pretty fast. As I said, it can be easily optimized by the Rust compiler. And the third option is when you do a uh, question mark operator and you propagate the error. That's the slowest one, but we all know that a uh, really convenient one to use, especially once you used library like anyhow uh, in your life. So now we can move to async. Async is a bit special on my presentation because I don't have really good tips how to deal with that. And the reason for this is that uh, async is different in all languages. It always creates a bump on that Rust learning curve because uh, every programming language treats async differently. With JavaScript, we have global event loop. With Go, we have Go coroutines. With uh, Java, we have uh, threads and some additional libraries to help us with that, like Cats.io or Zio. It's just different everywhere. So what I can give you is some tips only on what you need to grasp to be really uh, uh, or to be better with async in Rust. Of course, the first thing you need to really understand before you go into async Rust is the borrow checker and lifetime annotations. You first need to tackle this really well before you start doing any async job because everything is being moved into the scope of a thread, etc. But once you have that, under your belt, there is just a couple of options you need to really understand to be fluent with Rust async. First of all is, the, of course, the uh, basic building block called future, which what you need to understand and remember uh, is self-referential type. And because of that, it doesn't really like being moved in memory. And for that, we have pin type, which uh, is one of the types you need to understand to really get into async. Of course, you need to be aware that, and you probably are, that Rust doesn't have GC, but it doesn't also have uh, even a runtime. You need to pick a runtime, like Tokyo or other, and that you need to deal with shared state, with some built-in tools like Arc and Mutex. So all I wanted to say during this presentation is that when you start asking why, everything becomes much simpler. And when Rust compiler is giving you problems and a headache, always start with why. Rust compiler is not here just to compile your code. It's here to let you write better code. Thank you very much. <laughs>